get started. I'm Angela Roquet, author of the Lana Farming Reapers Inc. series, and I'm going to let everybody else introduce themselves and what they are most proud of at this current moment. So go ahead and go on down the line with Ellie. I'm Ellie Ann, and I am most proud that all three of my kids, like, got through elementary school without failing. <laughs> Woo! Yes. There are like lots of parties, but they made it through. Um, and then also, I'm a New York Times bestseller, and then a few weeks ago, came a USA Today bestseller. Um, I write thrillers, science fiction, fantasy. I have nine books out. Um, so get started right now on all my books. You can go buy them at 1743. Um, this is my newest series called the Magic Academy, and it takes place at a magic academy. <laughs> How am I supposed to follow that? Um, my name is Dave Ward, and I write uh, a lot of science fiction, and, and, and within that field, I write a lot of licensed fiction. So I like Star Trek, uh, Mars Attacks, 24, things like that. What am I most proud of? They're sitting on the front row. Oh, 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 I know, right? Uh, so, never read. <laughs> I mean, and I'll give a good rate for anybody who wants to buy it. No. <laughs> I need to break up the pair. Um, my name's Kevin Dillamore. Um, I'll brag on my kid, too. She got a 4 0 in her senior year of college and is looking at graduating summa. So, yeah. Um, yeah, and uh, if you want to know how much a student commodity degree costs, <laughs> um, I also write the uh, um, majority of my work in, uh, in, in media tie-in or licensed fiction. Not only do I do that with Dayton in Star Trek and other universes, but I also am a senior writer at Hallmark Cards. That's my day job, and so I get a chance to work with licenses with Hallmark through um, Warner Brothers and Marvel and Lucasfilm and Disney things like that. So I guess my, my latest book that I could, besides the book that came out last year that we wrote together, was the uh, um, the, the great big itty bitty Justice League Adventure, um, <laughs> which uh, you can uh, pick up on Hallmark.com and personalize with the hero of your choice. Cool. Awesome. He also made it on a Hallmark card this year. It's so hilarious. I did. I, 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 I'm, I'm sitting on a toilet um, drawn by the guy who draws the comic strip foul language, if you guys know foul language, so it's, it's kind of a big deal. I posed with pants on. Um, sure you did. Yeah, he's a myth that. <laughs> but they were eliminated somewhere in the editing process. <laughs> I, I have a picture of it on my phone for you to see. So does my mom. Oh, mom, no, no. I actually have this my contact photo for you. That's just wrong. I know, right? That's just wrong. <laughs> That's just wrong. <laughs> Look, this panel is about series, and we all write within different series. And so just to check, we'll tailor our questions a little bit. How many of you in here are aspiring writers? Oh, cool. All right, so we know which direction we need to go then. Um, I'm going to ask a few questions, since I'm kind of nerdy, being a girl swing over here still. I just had them sign the last couple Star Trek on the sidewalk, so um, I'll ask a few questions and we'll open it up so you guys can ask some questions. Um, one of the big things I'm curious about, especially with the Star Trek books for uh, Kevin and Dayton, is how do you keep track of all the facts within such a wide world? Do you have a book? Do you have some type of method you can share with us? Memory Alpha? <laughs> um, go ahead. Well, I mean, one of the nice things about writing this, for that particular license, you know, working with Simon Schuster and Pocket Books, is that we have a, um, a whole gauntlet of copy editors, editors that will look at things along the way. I mean, we were actually kind of uh, joking about this the other day that we, in the last book that we wrote, we realized that we had two characters that met at the climax of the book that uh, that actually should not have had that happen. And it went through two, went past us, went past at least one editor, maybe two, before somebody said, hey, you know what, this actually can't work. Um, and it's those kinds of things that we're very thankful for. When I was in journalism, the uh, you know, they told me in school, you don't have to know everything, you just have to know where to find everything out. And, and that's, very much the way I work when I'm doing Star Trek is uh, I will I will have a number of resources whether they're printed or online. Cool. Yeah. 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 Ye
The online community of Star Trek fans is very, very meticulously detailed on making sure stuff gets right, and I, and I trust it. There's no like secret Star Trek Bible that they give you after they conduct you into their... <laughs> uh, I mean, it helps that we're fans already, so we already are predisposed to have a lot of this stuff, you know, memorized, uh, particularly... Nerd. Yeah. <laughs> uh, professional nerd. But I mean, like, for, it, it varies depending on which flavor of Star Trek we're talking about. So if it's like the original series, I'm pretty comfortable not needing a reference most of the time. If it's one of the newer shows that I'm not as familiar with, then I, I have to kind of do some research. And there are websites out there, he said Memory Alpha very quickly, but there is a website out there that's basically a, a wiki that's devoted to Star Trek. And, and, and I mean, we're talking the minutia that gets defined, you know, the, the segments of minutia that build minutia, this website has it, and it has saved our bacon a lot of times. And then there are there are references that are, easy, you know, the, the type of stuff that they sell at the bookstore and in the encyclopedia, but like chronology, or the guide to aliens, or uh, that's what the Necronomicon, you know, whatever we are working with for a particular book, and we use those resources. Quick plug that there's a, a new edition, a two volume edition of the Star Trek Encyclopedia that's going to be coming out later this year for the 50th anniversary. I'm, I'm confident I'll be picking it up for, as a resource, but just because I'll enjoy reading it. But it's the little things that you will maybe not think about as you read that all of a sudden will flag in your mind. I mean, if somebody's writing a 23rd century Kirk era Star Trek book and mentions an away team. The average person may be able to, to slide past that, but but it matters to us that back in those days in, in the 60s, in the original show, they never said away team. They said landing party. Well, they tapped their communicator badge. <laughs> yeah, I mean, so so it's that kind of stuff that uh, um, that when somebody reads that and gets knocked out of our story because we got it wrong, that that's I very very much want to avoid that. Uh, it's no different from anything we're watching on TV or you're watching a movie. That there's a hole in the story that that makes you stop to think about something they did that doesn't make sense, and you have lost. All of a sudden, you're like, "Wait, what just happened the last five minutes?" Because I was sitting here thinking that what they did wasn't right. That, that's that's a grievous error. We don't want something like that. Well, I've got one more about Star Trek. Did you do one to add on that? Yeah. Um, I. The first series that I ever wrote, I co-authored it, which means that um, I had to communicate everything in my in my first draft um, that I needed and to fill inside the second draft. So I would, you know, fill out everything on every um, side character or any plot notes. So that became our bible, and then it grew as the series went on. And so it's the same thing here because. Um, you, all, all you do is as, as you're writing and if, and if you describe anything, you know, like let's say the color of, of her car, you know, something very mundane like that, you be sure to go back into um, your notes, just jot it down real quick <laughs> because it is as annoying as heck whenever you're in the second book and you're talking about the car and you're like, oh, what color was it, you know? And so you have to go back in the first book and find it. Um, so it's just, just it's really just common sense as you're writing, and you have just like this little detail. Then, then you go back to your your Bible. I keep it on this app called Evernote. You can use whatever the heck you want, and, and you write those little tiny details down as you're writing um, the series. We do maintain a crew roster of all the different ships, and so like when Vincent so and so gets killed by a lava monster or something in the book. Yeah. Right? Two books later, lot? somebody uses that <laughs> same instance. We have to remind them, you know, so and so died. You know, I killed them first. Yeah, I killed him. Or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> well, I wanted to kill him. We'll kill somebody else. Pick that guy. <laughs> so, yeah, we do have that. And then, oh, because it has happened, you know, where it's like we were in copy edits or something, you know, yeah. or we're in galleys. And I'm like, why is that name bothering you so much? Why is it, you know, and then you go back and you look, and oh, he got killed five books ago. Well, does he, he have a twin brother? Was he the one in the red shirt? Yeah. Um, <laughs> does he have a twin brother? He has one now. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> I find the, the longer a series goes, the harder it is for me. I just finished book six in my series, oh, and I <laughs> I literally wrote it with all five other books open in Microsoft Word, and I was control F every five minutes. Which dog was the better tracker? Which character, what color was his eyes again? Like, yeah. it, it was confusing, and so I think that was a big part of the reason why I decided my book series is ending at seven this fall, <laughs> and I'm starting something new. And I'll, I'll be remembering these notes and starting, you know, better tracker. Do you have a question? Do you guys keep like um, bios and like character profiles for all of these? I do. I try. 
try to. I really <laughs> love it though. Yeah, and then like, and then it's really fun because at the beginning, you just like get a scroll through all these like really beautiful people and like pick out your favorite characters, like what they look like. I like that kind of stuff. The little squash while the actors yeah. sort of play them. But, well, yeah, that's, that's the fun part. But keeping something like that is, is really, I mean, for me, for my purposes, I do it as I go rather than sitting down and trying to write an entire character profile. So for those of you, I mean, I'm trying to answer this for the people who might actually go out and do this kind of thing. Uh, you can, it, it's whatever, whatever suits your particular style, but what I find is that if I come up with an idea that goes counter against you know, whatever bio I might have plotted before I'm writing, don't be afraid to just erase that bio. I mean, there's nothing that says, because I wrote that two weeks ago, that's the rule that I've got to follow for the next five books. Well, and most of that's for the author's eyes only, so you yeah. can't, I mean, you've got a lot of flexibility. Unless you put out a series bio or guide, which I recommend doing that at the end of a series, so you don't have to worry about, you know, yeah. you want to edit a bio later on. We had a, a spin-off series that we did for Star Trek that was all original characters and situations, and, and the guy that helped co-create the series, he created a bio. And one of the things he did was he kind of did what Kevin is advocating. It's just a couple of lines about that person's background, like what species and what rank, and kind of maybe maybe some detail that stuck in his brain. But he also provided a headshot of an actor that he envisioned as playing that role. And uh, in one instance, and it's just it's just for like just us. It's not meant to be we're casting the show on on the internet or anything. But he had uh, we had a doctor on one of our ships, and in, in his very very irritable, very cynical. I mean, he makes McCoy look like happy, fun guy. And, but he cast Steve Buscemi as a headshot. <laughs> and from that day forward, I wrote that character as Steve Buscemi. <laughs> so it was like from Fargo and Armageddon. And so that, every time any word came out of his mouth, all I heard was Steve Buscemi for <laughs> eight years. For what we do, it's absolutely helpful because uh, we're already doing that with the main cast of the shows that, that we all know and enjoy. Um, to just have that little template to, to get back into our process for writing, it, it really is helpful. Yeah, sorry. Sir, I'm sorry. My question was, what do you typically know at the end of your series when you start it? Because we heard that, did everyone else hear that question? Okay. Have you seen the show Lost? <laughs> <laughs> Don't want to be lost. <laughs> oh, man, the reader can tell right away when you know where you're going. So I have two books out in Magic Academy, and I have plotted almost every scene in seven books. I think it works really different for different authors. Yeah, some are like episodic books, like a murder mystery series. Yeah, yeah. I, I like to know where a book's ending, but not necessarily the series. And it's always flexible, the series, but where a book's necessarily ending. A trilogy is easier to plot out all three at once, but I know a lot of authors who are cancers who just wing it, and they do fine. So it really is it's whatever you're comfortable with. I'm OCD. I like to plot everything. I mean, I have chapter descriptions before I start. We, uh, for one of the series we did, it was, it was supposed to be a limited run series, but they didn't know exactly how many books it was going to be. It was sort of like we've got these six core ideas, and then we can expand into side stories depending on how things shake out. And he had an idea of how the story was going to end. And he wrote the first book in the series, and then the editor decided to bring in Kevin and myself to write book two. And after that point, we were off the map because the editor said, "Don't use the series. Don't be. Don't feel bound by the guy." Use it as a point of departure, but feel free to bring something to the table if you think you're having fun. So we we developed a couple of ideas for the second book, and um, the other guy's first reaction was to take all the papers and just go. You know? <laughs> and then we we realized we were having a lot of fun, and it, and then then it became a a one-upmanship sort of thing, where he would write he wrote the third book in the series, and then we just started alternating after that. So, but he would he would uh, he put something in the end of his third book. And it was just this one scene with this one item. He called it, it was like a, a sarcophagus or something. And it had nothing to do with the rest of the plot. I thought, okay, he's laying something for us to do later. 
So I called him one night and I said, uh, so uh, this sarcophagus thing that you threw in at the end of your book, uh, what do you want us to do with it? Do you want us to set it up? Do you want us to do something to move the plot? What do you want to do? His answer was, I just put it in there and see what you guys can do with me. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, it's on now. <laughs> so not only did we use it, but we ended up turning it into the central thing that drives the rest of the plot of the yeah. series. <laughs> Take that, Mr. I'll see what you do with it. And so it, and it, became a, it became this thing. It's like, okay, I'm going to blow up a ship in my book. Well, I'm going to blow up a planet in my book. Well, I'm going to make a solar system disappear in my book. And at that point, the editor's like, boys. <laughs> Not measuring content. Yeah. And, and, but the uh, funny thing was that when we were looking at, uh, we were sitting at dinner with the editor saying we decided that we're going to end the series. We wanted to have it go out on a high note with this idea that uh, you know, we've got maybe one book in us left. And, and the, the publisher came back and said, um, well, we just heard from the licensor and they don't want you to end the series. They want, they want some, I mean, they're, they're happy with it, that sales are strong enough, we need more books. That was a bit of a curve, because we had to figure out, okay, well, how do we do this without necessarily making it look like they just uh, you know, shoot one, another book in there. Um, but I feel like we did the right thing. We, we took the, the book that we thought would be the final story and figured out a way to expand it into two volumes, but we did one additional volume that was a set of novellas that each of the four, each of the three writers for Vanguard plus the editor himself, we each wrote a novella that took place somewhere in the timeline. So it just gave people something to read, um, and uh, you know, to, to uh, illuminate some things that happened earlier in the series, but also go on and extend with a plot line that maybe wasn't novel length, but absolutely was critical to where we were going next in the uh, in, in the series. That that actually was a lot of fun. between if you have a really good idea and you can see it going like maybe two ways, do you ever get stuck like that? And if you do, how do you pick what way you go with it? You know, I, I don't know that I've ever been hit with that. I mean, I've, I've had ideas that I thought sounded great when I started writing and I realized that it's not working. Uh, and so I reworked the idea to be more, you know, or I get, I get a better idea. You know, like, oh, that's even better, you know, that kind of thing. But usually it's, it's one of those two. It's either, what were you thinking? Or, I've got a better idea. So. I had yeah, that just happened with the short story that, uh, that I worked on, where I was, uh, another author was gonna write, pick up my threads and go on with his own story. And as I was trying to break a scene, as, uh, um, you know, but we get ideas everywhere. Um, you know, not that I want to give you this visual, but in the shower, um, it hit me that the the two the two antagonists in the oh stop it the two bathroom yeah. shower what's next I was in a truck stop bathroom <laughs> and it occurred to me that it would be really cool of the two antagonists if the one that gets killed actually lived and the one who gets arrested was actually killed. And I started to kind of plan this, well, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and those, yeah, I was pretty excited about that too. And so I started going, well, if I switch this and do this, all this, and then it occurred to me that the guy who's writing the other story is already writing with the idea that I'm going to do the way I intended and told him. And I thought, well, I can't do that to Eric. I mean, that's horrible. So I put it all away. Um, but the idea of yeah, when, when, when you get when you're at a fork in the road, you think you go both ways. Start even just sentence by sentence. But well, if this would happen, then this would happen, and this would happen, and this would happen. Get yourself eight or ten sentences down that list, and then go to the other fork in the road and do the same thing, and see if you're eight or ten sentences down, which one you want to keep writing, which one is kind of fun to do. That's that's what I've done before. Kind of like a choose your own adventure. It's exactly yeah. like choose your own adventure. I usually go with whatever's gonna upset my main character the most. <laughs> I mean, that's that's kind of the point of it. I feel like you know you wanna you want people to root for them and see what's gonna happen. They wanna know how you're gonna get them out of this, and so yeah, you torture them as much as possible. <laughs> so whichever one's most painful. There, we had a couple um, of years. My favorite wizard quote, which is, "When in doubt, paragraph took always follow your nose." So just what I kind of 
also that gut reaction like this feels right. Got one here and then like it comes back here. Do you guys find it's helpful to have a sounding board of like the person that you bounce ideas off of or do you just go with your own ideas and just not ask for input for anybody else? 90% of my writing is has a sounding board. So that's great. Yes, absolutely. I just walk around my office and talk to myself. <laughs> <laughs> my wife is like, shut up. So I uh, yeah, we're sounding boards for each other. So. My husband is my sounding board, and, and he's a stay-at-home dad now. I told him to quit his job last year. Oh. So now he has to listen to me talk about my imaginary friends all the time. <laughs> <laughs> he's lucky. He doesn't mind. He dresses up as them sometimes. So. <laughs> <laughs> no, not so much, I'm hearing. <laughs> it doesn't help me very much. It just depends on your um, the, the way that you write. Someone. That gentleman in the back has had it for a while. Okay. Um, so basically, like, do you ever feel like you fly out here all the school, you know, with your entire experience, you know, fly out and then you're like, I don't know why I'm trying to say it. So, like, do you ever have that reaction where you fly out there and you have to deal with what's happening? It's the well of lost plots. I didn't catch the end of this question, I'm sorry. I didn't either. I just trailed off on you or that, I guess. So like, So you're saying that by, by plot, by, I, I, I've demystified my own story in the process? If you're bored of your own story, then you haven't done a good job of say. plotting it. I've never plotted a series, so I, don't, I, can't, I can't speak to that. I think there, there's a risk there all the time. Okay, for instance, a lot of my books, if I write uh, jokes into them, I think they're hilarious the first round through. Uh, after the 10th yeah. read, I'm like, this isn't funny, this is ridiculous. And I have to make sure I go find my sounding board and say, is this joke funny or am I being ridiculous? And they'll say, oh no, it's great. I've only read it twice, so it's still funny. And so yeah, there, there's always that risk that, so that's why sounding boards, critique groups are always good. Um, I know there's a lot of Star Trek fan fiction and stuff, and I don't know if there's fun for you guys. Um, but is it like, do you ever look at this stuff or do you ever just like, yeah. It's it's not a function of uh, my uh, uh, that that is not at all a, a criticism or a uh, or anything. It it absolutely is a function of I don't know where my ideas are going to come from, and if I'm reading I, you know if I'm reading a, a book or a story that uh, is not authorized by uh, by CBS to do, and even if it's just a line of dialogue or, or the idea of two characters doing something together or whatever, I would I do not want to be in a position where I have to say, you know, it's very possible my idea did come from that that story that's that's online because I enjoyed it. I mean, I'm sure I would I would enjoy a great many um, stories that are written outside the, the parameters of, of what CBS asks us to do when we do a story, but but I, I just can't. I mean I, I wouldn't I would not want to be in a position where I had to shrug my shoulders to CBS when they say, where'd you come up with this? And, and I mean, maybe on a bulletin board? <coughs> no, I don't, I, same, same thing. I like to, again, it's not quality judgment or judgment. Or, or, and I just, I tend to avoid it just so I don't want to be in that position where I've accidentally lifted an idea from somebody. Like, or subconsciously lifted yeah. an idea. It was a great story. It was even great when so-and-so wrote it in 1984. Yeah. And I, I don't ever want to be that guy. Yeah. Is the, the, the in politics they call it the appearance of impropriety. There you go. And and that's and that's very much what I guide myself with when it comes to uh, fan fiction. To be honest, I, I don't I don't watch many fan movies either. I don't get a chance to read a lot of the other Star Trek novels either. Yeah. I, I tend to I tend to if I'm writing one I tend to avoid them. I like to read them. I just I'm like okay I'm writing a Star Trek scene with Captain Kirk doing something and then I'm like that's a really awesome scene and I went didn't Greg do that a year ago. And I start all over again. So yeah. I, yeah, I tend to, I tend to, I, I tend to counter read whatever I'm working on. So I'm sure they have their own little fan fiction, little folder in their computer, though. Right. <laughs> yeah, mine is mine is like Smokey and the Bandit. So <laughs> I think we have a gray back here with a question. I.
Did, did anybody catch that? Had a unique personality, it's distinct. Yeah. Uh, I have a lot of characters in my series. I, I pack with a lot of different mythologies. And, um, you know, the main characters are the ones that I focus most on and keeping them more well-rounded. Well and there are a lot of really good plot and character development books. Um, so it's just really, I mean, even watching movies, you can see big distinctions of different characters. And some of them will share certain characteristics, which will be the reason why they're friends sometimes. So it's just a matter of separating it out and making sure you don't make a character who's generally very dry, happy to lucky, and those, you know, those character profiles. It's just cross-referencing. How do you guys? Um, just keep extend, just keep your notes, you know, just just have a, a quick little, um, you know, app on, on your computer or you, you write flashcards and you just, you know, write that um, they were like a stoner eighth grade who gave them the, you know, information that they needed, and, you know, and then you write that because um, in the next book, that stoner eighth grader might be in trouble. And so just um, kind of, uh, if there are any specific details like that, uh, don't forget to write it. Um, and I, that's really good too, though, um, just, just to flesh out your world in your mind. You know, like that's what we're doing. We're creating worlds. We want people to smell and feel and taste this world. And so um, whenever you do um, develop these characters, even for a um, clerk, you know, where this clerk starts yelling at them for no reason, or, you know, that somebody um, almost gets in a car crash with this, you know, total, um, total jerk, then, then that adds, you know, that adds to, to your story, and you've developed this angry person in your head, and believe me, the reader knows it, you know? The reader knows that you aren't just, this isn't just a card for world that you've, you've created. I say you find their strong points and you focus on those because that's what's going to give you your big deviations of personality. If you want to put it down in your character profile, what do they really hate? What do they really love? What gets under their skin? What makes them sad? And make sure when those things happen in your story or you make them happen in your story so you can draw that out of their personality and express them better. Do you want to take a... Everything that these two ladies have said and then also high turnover. You kill a lot of characters once in a while. You don't have to worry about it as often. <laughs> I'm being flippant, but feel free to, you know, feel free to upend the table every once in a while. <laughs> I have no idea what to say. Writing <laughs> romance on a beach, okay? You can't kill everyone. That guy who kicks sand in your face? <laughs> off him. <laughs> <laughs> Not maybe. I'm sorry, I had LASIK eye surgery. <laughs> 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 There's a green spot right there. Whoever she has just that. had LASIK. It's not mine. It's like on everything. Um, I was just going to ask, uh, do you find that the seasons uh, affect your writing at all? Like winter time, like all this scenery in your books are surrounded by that season? Like, does something affect your writing from your outside worlds oh, or yeah. from your current? Oh, yeah. Anything, uh, like anything can be a trigger. Or not the right word. Anything can be an influence <laughs> on your writing. Uh, yeah, there's the seasons of the year. I mean, if it's, a, if it's a dull gray storm like we had last week, all that rain we had last week, yeah, that was a bad week for one of my characters. <laughs> <laughs> uh, just because I just, I was close to a deadline. I hadn't slept in like 36 hours, and I was trying to push through to the last book. I'm like, you know what? Time for Joe to go. <laughs> I'm feeling angry. Yeah, I'm miserable. You're yeah, angry, right. miserable. Exactly right. Yeah, I got yelled at by my wife because it's a trash. And I'm like, well, Joe's having a bad day. <laughs> yeah, it could be anything. It could be it could be personal personal family tragedy, um, or, or you know, medical issues, or your own illness, or just anything can affect your writing. Yeah. I have um, seasonal depression, so that is like a huge, huge thing for me. So, you know, I'm a, I'm a sun lamps in the winter, I get on medication in the winter, like my lifestyle has to change a lot in the winter and it really affects my creativity. So I feel that like really heavy and it's 
have takes a great amount of um, um, I wouldn't say determination, but just like reminders that you know this is writing and this is part of my healing. Um, and so, so then I have to take care of myself first, and then um, writing is a way to to take care of myself. Um, but yes, weather affects my writing. <laughs> How about you, Kevin? Yes. <laughs> no, I, I, I don't know how it couldn't. I mean, truly. Yeah. I mean, you know, that's, I mean, I'm, I mean, I might have a scene affected by, uh, you know, whether I had a decent lunch. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, truly. I mean, it's. Not you sucked. That's right. <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wipe out an entire continent. I hated, I hated that calzone. <laughs> Uh, but but it, it, you, just, you just can't you can't help that kind of thing, um, and it's it's not and not that I am suggesting that if you're if you're just not you know if you're just not having a good day that your writing should reflect that right. or vice versa. But uh, but there are absolutely things that will that will just stuff that just occurs to you. I mean if uh, you know you driving down uh, a, a road and see. A, uh, and I mean, I've seen old homes. I mean, like you know, I mean, uh, you know, big mansions or whatever that I'm driving to and from work, depending on what route I take, and that can affect a setting. Hey, it'd be really cool to set the scene in this particular neighborhood or something. It can, and it can be other things too. I mean, it can be something you saw on the news, you know, or, or a particular issue that that concerns you or, or, or you are passionate about. I got very upset, you know, for a while there while the the. the Church out in Topeka, the Westboro Baptist Church was, you know, picketing soldiers' funerals. I took that kind of personal, so I ended up writing a story about a group like that that did bear as little as they did. <laughs> <laughs> I, just, I, just, I had to get it out of my system. You know, like, I, I, just, I mean, nothing, nothing bad. I mean, like I had, to, I wanted to have the other half of that conversation that we, never gets had. So yeah, we helped d develop a, uh, a, a, a series of six novellas based on our reaction to our government's response to Hurricane Katrina. Um, that uh, it just, we, and we thought, well, this isn't cool. And, and we were watching all this happen and, and it helped us um, get a story. We, we wrote five other writers in to, uh, to assist with each of the different novellas and basically um, started off with a uh, planetary disaster that Captain Kirk and the Enterprise were unable to prevent despite their best efforts. And, and, and Kirk's personal um, drive to help this society regain its footing over the course of what turned out to be the rest of his life. And that was something that, uh, that we really, we, we had a great time working on it and we uh, really enjoyed seeing what the other authors did with it. But that was based on how you know a, a current event that uh, that you know happened half a country away, as far as I was concerned, uh, played out. I don't know. I don't know which one. <laughs> I mean, she's had her hand up. She's holding it up. So right here. Okay. Oh me. Okay. Yes. Sure. Um, so You're on the air. When you have this big blog, how do you decide where each book's going to end, and how to split it up? Ends when the bad guy's dead. Like, it's not the overarching bad guy, yeah. but you have to end on a victory, basically, I believe. And, like, you know, it's like a beginning, middle, end of a story. Are you talking about like a multi part story? Yeah, just like if it's going to be like a series of books, like, how do you decide where one book stops in the, in the overall storyline? And yeah. in general, you want to, you want to, as Ellie said, you want to parse out the victories a little bit. You don't want to, you don't want to end a book on a downer. Unless no work for a part of Okay. No, but there's still a major, yeah. major ending. But I mean, there's, I mean, I guess yeah. I don't want to, I don't want to confuse a cliffhanger with yeah. yes. saying. I mean, it's yes. okay to, to have everything be really dire as a cliffhanger because part two is coming next week. Yeah. But yeah, uh, when you're when you're writing stories like that, yeah, you definitely want to leave the reader. You don't want to, you don't want to crush the reader on the last page. You don't want to, and you definitely don't want to do the bait and switch where you've had this whole story building to this awesome climax and you've won the day and then the last page it all goes away. As long as there's a little spark of hope, you can have a somewhat depressing ending. Yeah, as yeah, long yeah. as there's a little a bit spark. of speed or something. Yeah. But yeah. Well, we've all we've all watched seasons of TV that have a season finale that, that flip a switch at the very end that just leave us frustrated. Yeah. Yeah. Looking at you. <laughs> no, I'm not gonna name it. I'm not gonna name the show. <laughs> 
Oh, I'll, I'll, yeah, I'll, I mean, the, uh, um, um, shoot, what was that USA uh, Channel show that, uh, about two cops that was based on uh, uh, the show from Sweden? It's, I, oh, I have so killing. The, the killing. The killing. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Season one of the killing was building toward what would have made it one of the greatest seasons that I'd seen in years, and they added a, a, like five or six minutes at the end to make us excited about. Oh, hey, we got renewed, so look what's going to happen. And uh, oh, yeah. I, I, I quit the show. Yeah, I think she's, she's had her hand up for a while. Sleep right here. Yeah. Okay. okay. Um. So when you have like a big plot and. I say it's like filled with lore that the reader may not know until they go in and you have all these other plots that could arguably be their own book that affect your main plot at what point do you you know say oh this could be a prequel or something like that or say this can be condensed down to like one sentence mm -hmm. for those plot series books yeah <laughs> you want to say that one more time like how do you how do you balance when you have a plot that is affected by a lot of other things? I think you're talking about backstory here. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, where you know you're starting at a certain part of action, but there's a history to it. There's a lot of different ways to do it. I I've, I've had some friends um, go back and forth and have like flashback chapters, but there are more subtle ways of doing it. Just slipping in bits of that backstory to where it has a bigger reveal at the end. That's a really popular way of doing that to kind of show how your character's actions are influenced by their past. But there's a lot of different methods for doing that. Um, I would suggest not to be like the prequel person. Uh, you know, like you wrote the series and then oh, all of a sudden there's prequels coming out. Just do a good job of telling your story. Um, and then, but if the story doesn't start there, then start here, you know, like you start where the story starts. That's the, that's the trap developing a lot of backstory before you actually start writing. Because then you find yourself just filling in the history of the character and the world and everything else, and you don't get on with writing your story for, you know, four or five chapters, and that's 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 a death knell. If so, you read, like, the books from the 1800s, they're like, they all start at birth. Yeah. <laughs> like, well, Jane Eyre was born, uh, you know, and then when she was two, she moved. Uh, and it's funny that you that you mention that, because I, I never liked the Jane Eyre until I saw the latest movie where they started the movie in the middle of the book. Yeah. <laughs> and I and now I was like, okay, now I get it. Um, but uh, now, granted, we're we're talking about literature that's hundreds of years old. Um, you know, it sticks around for a reason. But uh, but for me, I it did I didn't find it accessible until it started the story at a point that I was uh, more quickly invested in the characters. And I think you could look at the same way. When you've got these things all plotted out, I mean, what's the thing that's most appealing to you? Where do you think the? I mean, you know, there's, the, you know, I mean, uh, you know, Lucas claims that he always intended to uh, to start his whole Star Wars saga with what became Episode Four because he said it was the most interesting movie of the nine he wanted to make. Anybody who saw one, two, three knows what he's talking about. <laughs> <laughs> so you, uh, somebody. You, sir. Yeah, like a little under, under 10 minutes. Oh, he's already had a question. Oh, sorry. okay. Well, I'm, I'm, yeah, yeah, I'm not the moderator. I'm sorry. <laughs> I've just seen his hand up for a little while here in the blue. Is that right? Uh, that's what I was I have a halo, so. Uh, pardon me if I phrase this poorly. In the setting where, where characters have more than normal human abilities, whether they're a hacker in an 80s movie, or they're magic, or they're Tony Stark and they can make fantastic technology. <sighs> How do you keep characters from colliding off of each other with their range of abilities and just fixing any plot very rapidly? That's a great question. Did you guys catch that? When you're writing characters with superhuman yeah. abilities or or um, uh, you know, I mean, I mean, things that they can access that would make life very easy and be able to solve problems very quickly, how do you make that interesting? That's an easy answer. It's called making bad guys that are as smart and as good as the bad, the good guys are smart. So you make it something that these good guys can't beat. That's yeah. That's why they that's why they came up with kryptonite for Superman. And that's why in fact one of the uh, anybody remember the six million dollar man, the Bond man. In the show in the movies that preceded the television series, he was, you know, kind of a James Bondish character and then they decided to make him a weekly guy. One of the things they did in the very first episode was introduce uh, the, 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 the plot point that severe cold 
uh, deteriorates the effectiveness of the bionics so that he becomes, he doesn't have his bionic strength. And that became a thing that got revisited throughout the show on occasion. Uh, the other one is, uh, I lost my train of thought. Uh, we've had to do that with Star Trek. We've had, you know, the, the android data, you know, given enough time, he can reason out any problem. He can figure out any mystery. So we had an issue where uh, we needed to have him out of the story in a way that made sense. So we, we literally engineered a subplot uh, to have him deactivated and infected with a virus so that he was out of the book for like 100 <laughs> pages or something. So, yeah. yeah, we could not, we, we had an alien race that was going to attempt to do something and every time we thought, oh, they could do it this way. Oh wait, no, they could do it this way. Every time we would say, they would figure yeah. it out. Yeah. Data would know what was going on. Data would do all this, and so finally we were just like, well, you know, screw that guy. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna rely on you guys to. I see a couple hands up. That gentleman in the corner. Cool. Oh, I'm Girl. sorry, that lady. Ah, see, the, I just the, said Lacey. <laughs> <laughs> we truly have lights in our faces, yeah. and, and there's only yeah. spots of where you are that are illuminated. How about everyone's gender neutral right now? And, uh, and, and so 
How much time has passed? Well, exactly as much time as I need. <laughs> How long have I been out? So, Yay. what you guys need to take from this is that just in every scene with just someone getting punched out or killed. <laughs> and that's how you plot the serialized fiction. Uh, funny. Uh, you have indeterminate gender. <laughs> <laughs> How do you prevent yourself from sort of having an ADD and be like, oh, this will be a really cool idea in the second book, but I want to write it question. now, and then, like, is it just force of will, or do you guys oh, have to yeah, that's, yeah. <laughs> do you want me to do that one? I have a Word document, and if something sounds really cool, but I know this can't happen for a couple books, I'll go ahead and type up that scene, because if that's what I feel like writing that day, I'm going to write it. And then I'll just stick it in a Word document in a folder, and when I get to that point, I'll think, oh, I remember writing this scene. And I'll look it up, and I'll realize it's crap, and edit it, rewrite it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm already on the second draft. One step ahead. Yeah, just stick it in a file and forget about it until you're done with the book you're working on. Exactly. Um, I, people always want to pitch trilogies and stuff, and, and, and series to, to, the, to the publishers and stuff. You know, it's like, pitch a good book, pitch a good story. Yeah. If they think it's worth more than one book, they'll tell you. They'll tell you. Because they're looking for them, too. But they, 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 what they don't want is you coming in with your marketing plan. I've got, I've got this massive 25 book series, and, and I've got all this idea, and the really cool stuff doesn't happen until book nine. You know, it's like, no, 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 I want to see that awesome idea you got in book one, and then we'll take it from there. I, I kind of have to believe that, like, I, I don't say anything for a, another book, but also that's because, like, you know, I've plotted it. So, you know, I, I want to use everything that I have. what's relevant when it's relevant. If something's happening and, and you think readers are gonna be confused by this, just include a little snippet of history of it, like this is when this happened or how this happened or, you know, if it's a business or if it's a, you know, a organization. The only parts of that is you need to. Yeah, if it's not information they need immediately, you probably don't need it in there right then. And you know, something else to consider, and I know this isn't necessarily the most popular way to answer this, but, uh, you know, when you write in first person, you can only reveal the stuff that the character knows. And you know, so if there's something that is a mystery that you want to reveal over time, or a backstory that that you don't want to just dump in every in everything, you know, a, a first person narrative allows you know the reader to uh, under to get stuff as it's revealed to the uh, to the storyteller. And if you do it in third person, just you know, use other characters. The story is yes. that you're the, the guy that has all the answers doesn't necessarily is the, always the point of your character. Right. Yeah, go ahead. Well, my, the problem isn't necessarily that, it's that there's some things that are like everyone would know about that should be obvious to characters. But well, are you third person point of view? I'm not sure. Like he said, she said, or I said. Well, you need to decide on a point of view. Yeah, so um, decide on a point of view and then um, and then you describe things in action. 
action. Um, because if it's an I said kind of thing, then and you said the character knows it already, yeah. then, then the character will yeah. simply yeah. describe what, what he or she's doing. Even, even that is just you only want to parse it out as needed at that point in the story. You know, it's like, I'm not going to be thinking about, like right now, you know, I have my 207 comic books I need to write or read before the end of the month, but I'm not going to tell you that now. Well, I mean, it's not a bad example, I just figured it out. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's not something that's going to come up in conversation. Yeah. Okay, it'll come up and it'll come up at some point when the, when the conversation sparks it, but it's not something I, it, it's not something I tell the bad guy in a gunfight. I gotta get home, you know. <laughs> another, well, and another thing to consider is that if if you if you're starting your story at a point where the reader needs all sorts of information before they understand what's happening, consider starting your story at a different point. Mm -hmm. Consider starting your story at, at a place where the reader doesn't need to be pre-equipped with everything that you want the reader to understand. Do we want to take another? We're done, right? Or I mean, are we, are we on schedule or ahead of schedule? Or? You're on. Uh, you're at time. All right. Uh, yeah, there's nothing else here. We close at seven. Oh, well, let's just keep talking. <laughs> <laughs> my husband's watching my booth, so yeah, we can get a couple more. Question. Just a quick question. Um, I know that with some of the license stuff, I assume you guys are constrained to a. Word count? I don't know. I assume you are. And well, if so, a, a, a novel they will say between eighty and hundred thousand words. So yes, there is a constraint. Okay. So how closely do you find that uh, constrains you when you're writing? Do you feel yourself in a rhythm where you you just know instinctively or just through practice that you're approaching that limit, or do you have to closely monitor that? There's some there's some wiggle room. I mean, generally when you get a when you get a word count guideline. Uh, Unless they specifically tell you don't go over that line, there's there's some wiggle room. There's, there's a little bit of percentage that you can come under or over. It's, it's mostly a strike team. That's how I look at it. Yeah. But yeah, after at this point, excuse me, after doing this long enough, mm -hmm. I get a rhythm about how the story's going to go, and I can I can get that and mark fairly closely. That said, when you're doing something that you're going to submit to an editor on spec or like a, con a, a contest with guidelines and things like that, you don't want to go. You don't want to say, "I know you only wanted five thousand words, and this is thirteen thousand, but it's really good." You know, just, just trust me. Trust me. You're going to be so glad that I overshot your word count by 150 <laughs> percent. I had a friend who I had a friend who wrote a book that uh, it was supposed to be like 100. Say 130,000 words, so it was, it was on the high side for a mass market paperback. And he turned into a manuscript of 290,000 oh words. My and I'm like, first Lord. of all, like, how do you lose track of time that far? <laughs> <laughs> what were you, first of all, who's your dealer in? Uh, <laughs> <What's the number? laughs> uh, but no, I mean, it's just it's like, yeah, there's, a, there's strike zones and there's like ballparks. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, no, for, for the license stuff, the, yeah, I know, right? I'm like, how do you? How do you do that? That's like three bucks. Yeah, exactly. So I mean, for for mass market fiction, it's usually eighty five to one hundred thousand words, and, and you can shoot past that mark or under that mark a little bit. It just depends. But I mean, and there's the, the reason is that it's you know it's how much paper they have to put on and print it on, and how it's going to be shipped and stored and everything. And you you think it wouldn't matter. We had a book that came in on the high side of of, of the mark. It was like one hundred and twenty five thousand words, and it was. The editor was fine with it, but they found every way they could to cut the number of pages that were going in the book. Yeah. They reduced the font size, they got rid of the chapter breaks on facing pages instead of, you know, so you have a chapter start on this page, it's, which never happens. Wow. And then I think at the very end, whatever our little effort, we had a little bit that was going to be closing out the book, and I wanted it separate from the rest of the manuscript, and they stuck it at the bottom of the page on the last book, wow. and totally robbed of the impact that I was looking for. And I'm like, well, that'll teach me. You know? <laughs> no, it's, it's 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 weird. It's a little business, and it's a little, you know, it's, it's it's all practicality because they don't want to deal with a three hundred thousand word manuscript when they're expecting a third of that. It's uh, it's insane. And, and his his advice about you know if the contest guidelines or the, or the submission guidelines say don't go over that mark, don't go over that mark. Yeah, I mean, you know, sometimes they'll put something in there just to see if you're going to follow directions. Yeah. Because you know, I mean, that means that's a writer I can work with. Yeah, treat submission guidelines like a job interview. Oh, 
unless you're George yes. R.R. Martin, and then right. come up right. with Right. <laughs> well, you guys have to turn it on in purple ink, too? Sometimes. Okay, all right, good. <laughs> and I want the green jelly beans. beans. <laughs> uh, there are cards on the chairs there by the door, so if anybody has to take off early, that have uh, codes to get the first three books in my series for free. So oh, there's cool. the, there some free ebooks in it for you guys. So be sure to grab a card before you leave the room and get you some free books. So, yeah. I also have a raffle going on right now. So um, I brought some, some cards um, with me here. You can fill them out, just name and email, and then I'll draw it tonight. And you could win um, a free series and then also some original art from here at the con. Um, so I'm drawing today and I'm drawing tomorrow. Um, stop my, by my booth, 1743. Um, and then, and I'd love to talk to you guys about writing. I really enjoy talking about writing. So come and talk to me about your books. My daughter is so enamored with this conversation. She's been asleep for half an hour. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dad. Alright, I got a big <laughs> unless somebody's got something pressing, you can always stop. Oh, one. Well, that guy's had his hand up. I'm oh, sorry. Okay. I got it. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah, well, yeah, we're happy to talk after the papers. Yeah. Oh, one more? Yeah? I just have a quick question. Would you prefer writing in past or present tense and why? I hate present tense. <laughs> that is a bugger to write. Oh, my word. Like, and it drives me crazy. To read. I'm kind of passionate about this. <laughs> 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 it's oh, 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 by the way, that 